Burroughs Furniture is built for the way you live. From ensuring easy assembly and disassembly to honoring highly requested new colors for their award-winning seating, they always have their customers in mind. Their modular seating is made out of durable materials to last and grow with you. And with Burrow, you always get fast, free shipping. Get up to 60% off during Burrow's Memorial Day sale at burrow.com slash ACAST. That's burrow.com slash ACAST. Burrow.com slash ACAST. It's that time of the year. Your vacation is coming up. You can already hear the beach waves, feel the warm breeze, relax, and think about work. You really, really want it all to work out while you're away. Monday.com gives you and the team that peace of mind. When all work is on one platform and everyone's in sync, things just flow. Wherever you are, tap the banner to go to Monday.com. Planning for your next trip? Elevate your travel style with Quince. Quince has all the jet-setting essentials you'll want for your next getaway, like European linen, premium luggage options, buttery soft Italian leather bags, and so much more and is all priced at 50 to 80% less than similar brands. Plus, Quince only works with factories that use safe and ethical manufacturing practices. Pack your bags with high-quality essentials you'll be wearing for vacations to come with Quince. Go to quince.com slash pack for free shipping and 365-day returns. I'm just going to be the, I'm going to be the dumb English person in this, in, this, in this episode, just asking stupid questions. Welcome to The Power Test. I'm Aisha Hazarika. And I'm Sam Friedman. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Power Test. And it has been a big week in politics, particularly north of the border in Scotland. And we have an episode today that's going to be pretty focused on the drama in Scotland where we have seen Hamza Youssef resign over his disagreement with the, the Greens, the latest of his uh, challenges that he's faced as First Minister. Aisha, you know Scotland a lot better than me as you're about to be Baroness of Coatbridge. To tell us a bit about now, why this has happened and why we've ended up in a situation where a first minister has resigned. I suspect a lot of our English listeners uh, didn't necessarily see that coming. Well, I think people are pretty shocked in Scotland as well. It has just been an extraordinary week in Scottish politics. Although given what's happened in Scottish politics, we have said that a lot. We've been saying, oh my goodness, it's <laughs> another ex- extraordinary week in, in Scottish politics. What I think a lot of people in England didn't realise is that the SNP, even though They have been in power in Scotland for 17 years. They didn't have a majority. So they had to get into this coalition with the Green Party. It was known as the Butte House Agreement. And it was kind of rubbing along pretty well when Nicola Sturgeon was there. And she was very much on board for quite a lot of the climate change stuff and also a lot of the more socially progressive policies. The government then had to roll back on its targets on climate change, which the Greens were very, very unhappy about. They had a big sort of falling out. But what was really interesting about it is it's a reminder that political management does matter Mm. in politics. What could have happened is that Hamza Youssef sat down with the Greens and said, look, we understand that you're really, really pissed off about what's happened. Let's try and find some way, almost Gwyneth Paltrow, Chris Martin, a sort of a conscious uncoupling. Let's try and have a kind of gentle way where we sort of gently drift apart, but we still kind of support each other on, let's say, big economic bits of policy. If there are motions of no confidence, you'll you'll support me. They could have kind of done this thing. Instead, they sort of went to war with each other publicly. And Hamza Yusuf decided to adopt a very teenage boy strategy. which was like, I'm dumping you before you dump me, that <laughs> kind of thing. That's sort of what it kind of was reduced to. And I think what he didn't calculate was just how pissed off the Greens were. And he never, ever saw in the game of chess that you have to in all politics, but particularly Scottish politics, He never thought that the Tories and Douglas Ross would kind of seize upon this, put a vote of no confidence down, and that the Greens would turn on him. That's been the really, really interesting thing. The really bizarre thing was when he he did his quote where he said, I didn't realise they'd be quite so unhappy with me. And this is the most basic 
emotional intelligence required to be a politician. He seems to have lacked that almost all the way through. And, and he's sort of gotten become known for giving these sort of slightly hapless quotes. It sort of seems like there, there's something missing in his basic sort of political lock. I sort of wonder almost if it's a result of him having been only an, an MSP during the sort of period of SNP uh, ascendancy and almost never had to play politics on a more difficult level until the past year. Well, I think there's definitely something in that. I think it's fair to see he did inherit a real mess yes, from, from Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah, yeah. I think that is very, very important. You know, the police investigation, the, the huge fall from Greece, that was not easy. But I think he's displayed a real inexperience and a political immaturity. He kind of tanked his own coalition very, very quickly through his own petulance. But I think what is interesting, just taking a step back and, you know, having been immersed in Scottish politics for a long time, it's really interesting about how parties can rise and fall so quickly. And Scotland is such an example of that. You know, Labour was so dominant in Scotland for such a long time, particularly the West of Scotland. And then Labour collapsed after that referendum, uh, the election of 2015, just, you know, all but one MP surviving. And the SNP looked completely unassailable for a long time, particularly with Nicola Sturgeon in power, because even though there were all these problems going on, she was very good at keeping a lid on that. And she was a sort of phenomenal political communicator, whatever you, you think about her. And I think just watching the SNP really falling apart after her resigning is really, really important. But the other thing which is fascinating, I think, is that there's real parallels between having had a Conservative Prime Minister since 2010, the last 14 years, and an SNP First Minister in Scotland for the last 17 years. They have dominated the spaces so much and they haven't had much opposition because the Labour Party has been quite kind of weak over these time periods. And it's a real lesson that having no opposition does not make for good governance and it leads to real arrogance. And I do think that's something that the Labour Party should really think about in terms of if it does win power in Westminster and in Scotland, which is you cannot take the electorate for granted just because you're riding high and there's no opposition. Because there may well be no opposition for a long time. In 2019, it seemed that both the Tories and the SNP were sort of you know, defying political gravity, having been in power for such a long time. I mean, the SNP doing incredibly well in Scotland again, and the Tories doing so well in the rest of the country. And yet here we are a few years later with them both sort of looking in complete disarray. Although I think the difference, the interesting difference is that despite everything that's happened with the SNP, two leaders resigning, police investigations, they're still mid-30s. The Tories would kill to be mid-30s in the polls. They've got this, this support base for the SNP, perhaps because of the independence issue, remains remarkably strong given everything that's happened over the mm. last couple of years. Well, look, I think there is a group of people for whom independence is a, an absolute ride or die issue. And the SNP is the only sort of political vehicle to, to sort of make that happen. Although they're failing on that at the moment. But I think what is interesting is that the salience of that issue is kind of falling down the agenda because so many other things have, mm. have not gone well. But it is interesting because for the SNP independence, Skegset has been their big thing. And of course, for the Conservative Party, Brexit has been mm. their thing. And I think we're seeing both, you know, in the rest of the country and in Scotland, people are like, yeah, I still do care about those issues, but I actually care about seen my yeah. doctor and schools. Absolutely, and... the economy and public services, when they start failing, they do just become more important than these perhaps more meta issues that sort of go to people's identity. I think the other thing, though, that we can take away from this, particularly with our lens on Labour as our podcast is, my goodness, Keir Starmer is a lucky general. Well, uh, there's a monkey's paw somewhere. I'm absolutely <laughs> sure of it. There is a monkey's paw with several fingers now curled around. Th there is no way that, that anyone gets this luck without some kind of magic. Going. He's done some deal with some devil. So I mean, <laughs> it is absolutely in. I hope he buys a lottery ticket. That's all I can <laughs> I mean, and of course, you know, it's to some degree you make your own luck and he's made the Labour Party more electable. But you could not have assumed that both the Conservatives and the SNP yeah. would collapse in this way or descend into a rabble in the way that they have. And uh, we have a, a brilliant guide to take us through all things Scotland um, in Kezia Dugdale, who was a former Labour leader, probably through the, some of the more difficult periods in Labour's Scottish history, but couldn't find anyone who, who sort of knows the intricacies of Scottish politics better. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our next guest because it has been quite a week in Scottish politics and she knows 
everything about Scottish politics, having been leader of the Labour Party in Scotland from 2015 to 2017. She was uh, an MSP for Lothian from 2011 to 2019, and she's now the Associate Director at the Centre for Public Policy, which is associated with the University of Glasgow. Kezia Dugdale, welcome to the Power Test. Thank you. And you missed in that introduction the fact I'm your pal as well. So that should have come top of the billing, I think. We had Sam's dad on last week. This <laughs> week, we had to make sure that I got a look in. So we got a very dear friend. So look, this has been such an extraordinary couple of weeks in Scottish politics. I mean, it's like a stushy on steroids. Just your kind of take on, on what you've witnessed phenomenally shocking events and I don't really say that lightly given you know, the wider political world that we all operate in just now we're, we're not short of big moments that seem to change everything but nobody really saw this coming let me give you an example a couple of weeks ago the Scottish government moved away from its climate change targets and legislated to achieve a certain degree of its climate change ambitions by 2030 and it had to admit it was never going to meet those and because they were written into law that law was going to have to be repealed and the deal that the SNP had with the Greens survived what should have been a, an existential moment for any environmentalist in the country, right? That the government was saying it could not meet its climate change targets. The Greens largely sucked that up and they lived with it and they used the government line and the Pete House agreement survived that. And everybody thought that, you know, if it could survive that, it could survive almost anything. Yet seven days later, it comes crashing to the ground. So it was really shocking. There was a a significant surprise to most people that the Butte House Agreement, the document which governments the relationship between the SIP and the Greens fell apart in in the way that it did, at the time that it did. But the thing that ended Hamza Youssef was was Hamza Youssef. It was the way that that separation was handled on the day that's really created the circumstances we're faced with in Scotland now. So what happens next, I guess, in terms of the position we're now in, as far as I understand it, is that the SNP essentially have some time to find another leader. And only if the Scottish Parliament can't agree on that person, would there be an election? So the next question is, who will that leader be and will they be acceptable to the rest of the Parliament? So the First Minister has indicated an intention to resign. He has not Mm. resigned. That's important Mm. because it means there's no set ticking clock. Nominations are open. They'll close on Monday and if there's a race, we'll find out on Monday what that race looks like in terms of how many hustings there are going to be, how people will vote and when we'll know the outcome of that selection contest. That person then will go before the Scottish Parliament and for a vote to become the First Minister. Convention would say that that person would be adopted by the Parliament, but right now you wouldn't put your house on that Mm. if that vote were to be lost then the parliament rather than the government have 28 days to find a successor if they can't do it within 28 days then we're in the situation where uh, the government goes to the king and an election has to be called and if an election is called there still has to be another one in 2026 right it's not it doesn't reset the clock on that that's right and actually i've been writing this week um, and i've been i've been whispering it as well that actually there's there's many a case here for all the parties to bring the 2026 election forward a year to 2025 because mm. that would address a couple of things. It would address the democratic deficit the new First Minister is going to face. They're in the same position as Rishi Sunak mm. in that they'll be the, the second leader of their party not to have broad popular support from the public in the form of a democratic mandate. But also in truth, it would really help the opposition parties too. So as much as Anas Sarwar is having the time of his life right now and it is a really good time for the Labour Party, He doesn't necessarily want an election tomorrow because all his best people are selected as Westminster candidates. There's Mm. the whole issue of producing a manifesto and having to do so arguably before a UK general election or knowing exactly what a Labour government might mean for the Scottish Parliament. So there's so many variables there. I think it's really in everyone's interest that that 2026 election is brought forward a bit and would also allow the First Minister to push away some of his critics just now and say, I will go to the people, but I'll go to the people next year. And I know I'm going down a bit of a rabbit hole here because there probably won't be an election now. But just out of interest, if there was one and the polls are broadly right in terms of the Scottish Parliament vote, it would be a parliament in which Labour and SNP would probably have quite similar numbers of of seats, as far as I understand it. What would a government look like in that that kind of situation? So I I think there's a growing consensus that the next government post-2026 or whenever the election is will be a minority administration. So whether the SNP edge it or, or Labour edge it, we're, we're back into the circumstances of that party having to secure votes across the parliamentary chamber. 
that's really interesting in and of itself. We did that in 2007, but we did it in a very different time. We did it before Brexit, before the 2014 independence referendum, before a wave of global populism. You know, we were far less tribal and far more willing to work together in 2007 than we are now. So it's a fascinating perspective. And Kez, you know, you presided over the Labour Party at a really, really difficult time after the absolute wipeout in 2015, which saw just one Labour MP survive that absolute bloodbath of, of the 2015 general election campaign. Labour arguably as well, really, even though Alistair Darling led the Better Together campaign, which which won, Labour really felt like they bore the brunt of people's anger after the referendum, which saw the, the unionists win. You had a really, really tough time. I remember it very, very well. Is there part of you which is just like, oh, I can't believe how this is all falling apart from the SNP. Is there part of you which is like, yes, I knew this day would come? Or is there also part of you which is like, why did I end up drawing the short straw when it was so difficult? What's the point in having regrets or letting any of that bitter energy into your life, right? No good to come Oh, come on, Kez. We all love a bit of bitter energy. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I am, of course, like unbelievably jealous of uh, Anas and the situation that he finds himself in on the cost potentially of becoming first minister. I would have loved to have had that job. But I also, I think, and, and look back, did he, a huge service to the Labour Party at the time that, that needed somebody with a bit of energy and a bit of youth to go, come on, let's pull ourselves together and put our best foot forward. And I did that in my early 30s as, as a very naive, to a certain extent, politician. But with that naivety came a degree of idealism that allowed me to talk about the things I cared about. And, you know, look, I'm really proud of what I did across the time I was a politician and across the period that I was leader. Of course, I would like it to have happened in different times. I would particularly have liked it to not have transcended four elections and the EU referendum. <laughs> but, you know, you can't pick these things. And so I'm very excited for the position that Labour finds itself in now. And I wish Keir Starmer and Ash Sarwar every bit of success in that regard. And, you know, I, I'm there to cheer them on. I'm there to offer a bit of advice, which is sometimes welcome and sometimes not. So many of my peers are standing for the first time now and I'm so excited for them. Lots of people we know, Aisha, who are the yeah. politicians of tomorrow. Well, one of the things that I'm really struck by is the number of um, people who are standing, people who we knew very well. And actually it was felt that the Labour Party really hemorrhaged talent and it feels like a lot of good people are coming back to the Labour Party. They're wanting to stand. But a lot of the problems that Labour Party faced have not gone away. Uh, support for the SNP is dropping, but support for independence still remains very, very high, particularly amongst young people. There is an argument that you know people are fed up of, of the SNP in the same way that they're fed up with the Tories. But if a Labour government does come in and you know win the right to, to govern Scotland, a lot of those problems are not going to go away. How does Labour sort of navigate that, particularly with that younger generation who are, if they're not indie supporters, they're indie curious. And you yourself, as somebody who's a, as a former Labour person, you yourself have said that you are emotionally sympathetic to the cause of, of independence. How does Labour build a bridge with those people, particularly younger people? So I'm, I'm not sympathetic to independence. What I want is to rewire Britain. I want to change the voting system. I want greater devolution. I want employment law. I want immigration powers. There's a lot of public policy change that I want, which in a hyper-polarised binary debate in Scotland somehow turns me into nationalist, right? Like, whatever happened to having nuanced conversations about how public policy actually works, how the political process actually works? Oh, Kezia, make... come on. Nuanced discussions about politics in Scotland. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I, I want to talk about this because I'm bored of it now, right? So the, the, the thing that happened is that from 2012, when the Edinburgh Agreement was signed up until about 2022, Scottish politics for that decade was defined by the Constitution. Your position on Healy Bins was influenced by your position on the Constitution. That has changed now. And just going back to your earlier point, what's changed it is, you see it in the polling, is yes, support for independence is still consistent around 45%, and sometimes it tips over the 50% mark. But as an issue, it's fallen way down the rankings, right? So it no longer determines how people vote in the same way that it did before. That means Anas has an opportunity to do what I could never do, which is try and get votes from both the SNP and the Conservative voter base at the same time. Britain isn't working. Andy Burnham says that. Carwin Jones said that, Von Gethins will say that. There are people the lengths and breadth of the United Kingdom that want to talk about how we rewire Britain in a different way that represents a modern progressive democracy. You don't have to be a nationalist to believe in that. 
In terms of what that means for the SNP, if you're right, the independence is becoming less of an issue, despite remaining quite popular. And certainly you can't see any route in the short term for there being another referendum or there being a sort of another big debate about independence. What does that mean for the SNP who've defined themselves around this debate? And we can see in their leadership contest that you've got candidates with really quite different positions on other important issues, but who just happen to agree on this issue. How does the next leader of the SNP define their party in an era in which independence isn't the dominant conversation? So you won't hear this opinion much, but I think there's a real opportunity for the SNP to rebuild its base off the back of Labour winning the general election and doing so well. I think you could see them default to a message that's worked very successfully for them in the past, which is to say, you know, vote for us, we're stronger for Scotland. Mm. You know, we will only ever talk about Scotland. We will be distracted by issues that need to be addressed because of needs elsewhere in the United Kingdom. And one thing I've always kind of been bemused by is why the SNP don't develop their dividing lines with Labour in a clearer fashion. So what I mean by that is there are three areas where the SNP could really mark out different territory on the centre-left from Labour in Scotland and benefit from that in the aftermath of the UK general election. The SNP want to go back into Europe. There's no sign that Keir Starmer wants to revisit the European question. The SNP are avidly pro-immigration. Keir Starmer can't talk in that language without fear of losing votes elsewhere in the United Kingdom. The SNP want to expand the welfare state. They want to scrap the two-child cap. They want to increase lots of aspects of social security. Rachel Reeve says she's not going to turn the spending taps on for the first couple of years. Three really clear dividing lines the SNP could muster quite differently to say Labour are no different from the Tories and on that basis capitalised between the general election and the Scottish Parliament election. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point because it's a problem for Starmer, not just with Scotland, but for other parts of the UK. London would be similar where the Labour coalition is much more liberal than it was in 1997 under Blair. And the Labour vote is much more liberal, even if the public as a whole is more socially conservative than that. So when he's trying to calibrate, where do I go on welfare? Where do I go on immigration? In in the longer term, maybe where do I go in Europe? It's going to be very difficult for him to find the right place. I think Tony Blair got away with being quite socially conservative on some of these issues in a way that Starmer was going to, to struggle with. And that's going to play out perhaps first in Scotland, perhaps first in a in an election in 2026 after a year or two of a Labour government. Yeah, I completely agree with that. The flip side of it, of course, is that Anna Sarver is going to run a campaign going, these guys have had 17 years. Right? He doesn't need to I say... haven't done any of these things yet. <laughs> He doesn't really need to say it. He needs to make more than that. Mm. One of the things that has sort of done very well for the SNP is the sort of grievance message, which is we are always shackled by Westminster and, and we can never reach our, our full potential. And if there is a, a Labour first minister and a Labour prime minister, then that is, as you say, an argument that they can prosecute. What about the the kind of differences between Anna Sawa and Keir Starmer on things like Gaza, for example, and I think he's got slightly different positions, I think, on welfare stuff. How much do you think the SNP can can exploit that during a, a short campaign? Well, they'll have a good go, right? And every Labour leader combination that's come before the two of them has faced the same question. I, I had this on repeat and m- my response to it was to do a deal with Jeremy Corbyn, which allowed and the Labour Party in Scotland to take a different position from the UK party on issues which were reserved to the UK Parliament. And we did that through our party conference. I think that gives Anas Sarwar, the leader of the Scottish Labour Party, a mandate to, to talk about the things he wants to talk about. And you have seen him do that. The question that always comes and bites, though, is, OK, so when we elect your MPs and send them to Westminster, whose whip do they take? That remains a difficult one. I think that's absolutely right. And of course, perhaps the most stinging words from a a former Scottish Labour leader was Joanne Lamont, who said that the Labour Party in Scotland was dismissed and seen as the branch office. And that is a, a line which the SNP and other commentators have used against the Labour Party. And the reason why it it was such a tough line is probably there was a sting of truth about it in terms of how how people felt. I mean, do you think it would be good for a kind of modern Labour Party to allow there to be differences in views? Should they countenance, instead of having everybody just saying the same thing and having the same view, every Labour political leader, should they allow some differences of opinion on, on things? For example, would it be good for Anna Sawa to kind of have a, a couple of strategic rows with Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves to show that he can stand up for Scotland? 
So a couple of things on that. One is you can only really do that from a position of strength. That is about power dynamics and, and who's got the levers of power. And it might be harder for an ass to do that when he's the leader and Keir Starmer is the, the prime minister. You just need to look back at Jack McConnell and Gordon Brown for how that worked when Jack tried that nearly 20 years ago. And secondly, now you're the one arguing for a more nuanced approach. I, I would love it if we could be really comfortable with the idea that politicians in the same party could comfortably hold slightly different positions on some of the big topics of the day. It feels like we might be asking too much of our political class at, at the moment, but that's the ideal world. It really shouldn't be beyond the wit of man that we can operate on that basis. And I think the public respond really well to that. I think it's going to be harder and harder to avoid as the English mayors become more and more yeah. powerful. You know, if you've got Andy Burnham and Sadiq Khan they're not going to be able to agree to everything a Labour government wants to do nationally for their own political positioning. So you're going to get those kinds of differences of opinion happening more and more. You know, if they're serious about devolution, that's going to happen. So mm. maybe we'll get to the nuanced grown up conversations, who knows? Well, we ha- we're having them here today on, yes. on the power test. <laughs> Kez, one other thing I wanted to move on to. When you look at the implosion of, of the SNP, there's a number of factors and poor governance is is, is one of them, particularly on, on a lot of key things that people really care about, schools and hospitals and the ferries and drug deaths and things like that. But the row over social and equality policy, such as the, the gender reform stuff, really lit sort of the touch paper under the SNP. And, you know, I think it was a real contributing factor to Nicola Sturgeon standing down. I think there's obviously other things at play as well. What lessons are there for, let's say, a future Labour administration in in Scotland? Because I think my view is I think there was a, a view taken of Scotland that Scotland is just this kind of progressive beacon now and everybody in Scotland thinks the same way that the Greens do on trans rights and, and everything else. And that really wasn't the case. Yeah, I mean, I think this period of, you know, being very focused on liberal, progressive, cultural, identity-based issues is going to end with this move from the Butte House Agreement to minority government because they just won't be able to get some key things through that was perhaps on their list of things they wanted to do. So I'll give you one example of that. You've reported lots about Scottish law around hate crime and there are lots of uh, gender critical people who've gone, well, one of the big problems with this hate crime legislation is that it, it didn't include women. Well, they didn't include women because the women's groups didn't want it to include women. They wanted a second um, piece of legislation that was solely focused on misogyny as a crime and that misogyny legislation was supposed to come forward in this year's legislative programme in September. It's now in jeopardy because of the definition of a woman that would need to go into any legislation about misogyny. So does a definition of misogyny include trans women or not? Discuss that type of issue and will disappear. Another really good example would be juryless rape trials. So the Justice Secretary only got stage one of um, a bill to do just this by a margin of one recently because six SNP MSPs rebelled on their own government's justice legislation. So that had nothing to do with trans rights. It had to do with women's rights, a different end of that particular spectrum. Really difficult for the SNP. Minority government means the SNP will no longer be able to ban things in the way that they used to do. They'll no longer be able to give out free things in the way that they used to do. And they also will be able to do the thing I wish they'd done at some point in the past 17 years, which is do some serious reform of public services. So this is going to be a government that's going to have to scale back its ambition. It's going to have to focus on bread and butter and issues of the NHS and the economy. And it's going to have to secure support across the parliamentary chamber to do anything at all. As you mentioned public services, I have to ask about this because education is my background. And I have been looking with some horror at what's been happening in Scotland for some time in terms of curriculum for excellence and this approach to curriculum taken in in Scotland. Is there a sort of sense now across the parties that there does need to be a change in focus or is there sort of a view that actually this is still the right way of doing things, we just didn't implement it right? So I, I... I don't generally talk about education policy a lot because my wife is the cabinet secretary for education and I'd quite like to, to be able to go to go home. Go home um, after <laughs> But what, what I would maybe just emphasise is on, on the point about curriculum for excellence. I mean, that was an idea that was introduced by the last Labour government. So it was mm, Peter Peacock, I know. <laughs> who was the education secretary that championed the principles of um, curriculum for excellence. I think there's a moot debate around whether 
the ideals of curriculum for excellence haven't been fulfilled because there hasn't been the resource to do it mm. or whether they were just the wrong ideal. Mm. And I'm not going to offer my view on that, Sam, because <laughs> I, I would like to, to go home in peace tonight. Fair enough. I have my very strong opinion on that. Tell us it then. You, you can talk. You can say what you like. I, I, I think the principle of having a curriculum based around what I would call pseudo skills, like aspirations, like creativity and so on, is just not what a curriculum is supposed to do. And a curriculum needs to actually be pretty focused on what children need to know. And then you can build some of those other things around it. But I think it's it's ended up confusing Scottish teachers and Scottish schools quite badly. And we've ended up in a position where what was a brilliant Scottish education system has, according to the OECD anyway, dipped below England's now. Now. Can I ask you another question about that? I'm going to come on the show and throw the format yeah. cl- clean out. But I'm always struck by the debate around educational inequality, right? So so mm. to what extent, from, from your expertise, do you think schools can address educational inequality and, and how much of that is beyond the school gate? I mean, I think, you know, we've got quite a lot of research on this over many, many decades. And the, the sort of consensus is, is about 20%. Schools can deal with about 20% of, of a child's life chances, but everything else comes down to poverty. And I think you know, that's my big argument in England is, is actually, I think our curriculum is pretty good and our academic performance has been pretty good. And our schools are in trouble because of the big increase in child poverty and the associated increases in mental health difficulties and in special educational needs as well that we've seen here. So I think, you know, you need to have a big investment in that pastoral support precisely because it's critically important as well as having a really good education. I guess the reason I posed that is because you'll remember Nicola Sturgeon said that she wanted to be measured by the degree to which she Mm. was able to tackle educational inequality and I just wonder now whether that was far too lofty and ambition. Yes, absolutely, given the given the, the things that she had control over at the time. But I, I suppose my question was less sort of what do you think we should do, but whether there is even a sort of debate about some of these public services questions, whether it's education or health, is there a sense that these things are not working as they should and could be better? So the most striking intervention we've had recently, I think, is from the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which has pointed out what Scotland is currently spending on its public services. Some of that free stuff that we've referenced and the gap between that and, and what it brings in in revenue and how that gap's likely to grow over the next few years. So there are going to have to be some dramatic changes to things like the provision of free higher education, the provision of free prescriptions, the provision of free personal care, the new child payment the Scottish Government have introduced. Something in that vein is going to have to give, and that's going to be in the entry of the next government. And so if that stuff does have to give, how do you think that's going to play for First Minister Anna Sawa coming in being the first minister to cut free higher education or cut free prescriptions. I mean, that's not going to go... I mean, it might be the right thing to do, but it's not going to go down well. It's going to be incredibly difficult for whoever comes into office in 2026 because a lot of these very difficult things have been kicked down the road by the current administration in the box marked too difficult. I don't think that puts an ass off. I I think, if anything, he'll actually relish the opportunity to do what Labour people do with power, which is to fundamentally reform public services and and advance uh, the role of the state in our lives in a meaningful and positive way. So I think it's only really Labour politicians that can do some of that hard stuff at these key moments. The only thing we've ever done when we've been given the opportunity to govern, he just has to get over that hurdle first. Obviously not going to be easy. You know, this Alex Salmond who said, you know, the rocks will melt in the sun before tuition fees will come back in, in Scotland. But already, if you if you listen or read between the lines of what Michael Mana says, prominent Labour MSP is driving much of the policy development. That question is now a question in terms of how Labour is going to approach its manifesto process for 2026. Does it want to keep free tuition or does it want to keep free school meals? If you're talking about tackling poverty and inequality, we all know that the way to prioritise money is in those early years. So that again makes you look at at higher education and tertiary education or what happens in the senior years of school and ask some fundamental questions about how you redistribute that public spending that you have. Just to return to sophology at the end, because I can't resist it. One election we have got this year is the general election. And Scotland is obviously a key battleground in that as well. What's so interesting about it is that there are so many seats that are really, really close. And it could, you know, the SNP could win 40 seats or 10 seats. And and there's actually not that much difference between those two things. Where do you think we're at at the moment? And what are the sort of key things to watch for, for people trying to sort of think what might happen in, in, in the general election in Scotland? This would have been so much easier to answer two weeks ago when we knew who <laughs> the leader of the SNP was going to be. I think it's very likely it will be John Swinney. And I think the consequence of, of John Swinney is a levelling off of the SNP's decline in the polls. 
So I don't think they're going to have a resurgence. I don't think they're going to start creeping ahead of Labour again, but they'll stop falling through the floor. That, I think, makes all of the seats along the central belt, the M8 corridor in Scotland, puts them all in play. So look at what happened in 2017 when I was leader and we went from one to seven. That was a good result on the night, but we were within a margin, I think, of about 1,800 votes in another 20 seats. Mm. So one or two percent here or there will mean an enormous amount on the night in terms of whether an Asara comes away with upwards of 25 seats or whether it falls short of 20 or even actually whether you could reach the dizzy heights of, of 30 again. Mm. I still think you're going to be in a situation where the Labour Party's resurgence in Scotland will be a central belt phenomenon. Mm. So I don't think you're going to see massive progress in in Aberdeen or in Inverness or potentially in Dunfries, all areas or seats that Labour held in 1997. I I still think those are the seats that would require a resurgence that hits the 40 mark rather than, you know, hitting the 30 Mm. mark. But you'll see huge progress across that M8 corridor and into Fife. And Kezia, one of the big criticisms of Labour when it fell in 2015 was that Labour sent its best and brightest to Westminster. And once they got to Westminster, they all wanted to get into the cabinet. They wanted to get these big fancy jobs. And actually, they didn't really care that much about Scotland. Is there a danger that that could be replicated again? Because as you say, so many good people are standing to be Westminster parliamentary candidates. I know the Labour Party is sort of hunting around for people to stand in the Holyrood elections. How mindful should Labour be of not doing that again? So that in the past was by design, right? Because Westminster was the exciting place to be. It was the centre of of all political debate. I think post-independence referendum, most people in Scotland view the Scottish Parliament as the central place where politics is kind of done in the country. And Westminster is this almost weird place that talks about defence and foreign affairs and doesn't really touch issues beyond welfare that, that kind of matter to everybody's day to day. I think now we're in a situation where the brightest and best find themselves standing for Westminster by accident rather than by design because of the chronology of elections. And and if there were a Scottish plan of election anytime soon, it would be really difficult, I think, for Labour to find people within its existing party base to stand in all the constituencies and lists across the country to improve the overall quality of the group. There's some really brilliant people in Anas's cabinet, but I think he has already said already that he would like to bring in some new faces and some new expertise. If he has a really good general election result, that job gets all the harder. But what a lovely problem to have, right? So... Kezia, our quick fire questions, which we're asking everybody. Which person, dead or alive, real or fictional, would you add to Keir Starmer's potential first cabinet and in what role? John Smith, Minister of the Portfolio for his combination of humour and intellect. Excellent choice, Kez. It's on brand, right? What's the issue you'd like to see the Labour Party bring up the agenda? Housing. It should have been one of the five missions. It's at the root of so much poverty and inequality, but it's also at the root of growing our economy in terms of um, the jobs that house building would bring, but also in that level playing field of giving everybody a chance at getting on in life. And what's the one test you'd set for Keir Starmer and Labour to prove they want power in order to change Britain for the better? The Resolution Foundation tell us the single action any new Prime Minister could take to tackle child poverty would be to get rid of the two-child cap. I think that's how Keir Starmer demonstrates how and why he's going to be different from the Conservatives in office. Well, in my post of 10 things Labour should do very quickly, my number one choice was getting rid of the two-child limit. So I completely agree. Take 600,000 kids out of poverty with one move, which you can do overnight. Thanks so much for joining us and for informing us ignorant English folk about what's going on in Scotland. Speak for yourself. (laughs) She's a baroness for Court Bridge, for goodness sake. How have you missed that? (laughs) Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And if you are not a member of the Power Test crew, you can head to the paratest.co.uk or the paratest.substack.com. You'll get episodes ad free and early before anyone else. Uh, and there's also an exclusive chance to be part of the podcast and lots more. Also, Do get involved with us if you've got any questions or comments or like ideas you'd like us to explore. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us on pod at theparatest.co.uk. You can also get involved on social media as well. And we've also got our brand new YouTube channel, which is a power test pod. And you can find clips on there. 
The Power Test only exists because of the amazing support from you, our members and our supporters. And we're also delighted to have the backing of some brilliant organisations like the Future Governance Forum, which is providing intellectual and practical infrastructure vital to the revival of progressive government in the UK and the Centre for Progressive Policy, a think tank championing inclusive economic growth. We're also really glad to have support from the Institute for Global Change, who provide us with exceptional research and briefings, and also partner with the fantastic Labour List, bringing to life many of the issues, themes and discussions we're covering on the pod. Planning for your next trip? Elevate your travel style with Quince. Quince has all the jet-setting essentials you'll want for your next getaway, like European linen, premium luggage options, buttery soft Italian leather bags, and so much more. And it's all priced at 50 to 80% less than similar brands. Plus, Quince only works with factories that use safe and ethical manufacturing practices. Pack your bags with high-quality essentials you'll be wearing for vacations to come with Quince. Go to quince.com slash pack for free shipping and 365-day returns. Need new glasses or want a fresh new style? Warby Parker has you covered. Glasses start at just 95 bucks, including anti-reflective, scratch-resistant prescription lenses that block 100% of UV rays. Every frame's designed in-house, with a huge selection of styles for every face shape. And with Warby Parker's free home try-on program, you can order five pairs to try at home for free. Shipping is free both ways, too. Go to warbyparker.com slash covered to try five pairs of frames at home for free. warbyparker.com slash covered. Ever Googled your own name? Prepare for a shock because your personal info, including addresses and phone numbers, is out there, especially with the recent hacks at some big phone and healthcare companies. But here's where Aura steps in. Aura scans the dark web for your sensitive information and sends real-time alerts. Aura also actively requests that your information be removed from data broker sites, putting you back in control. Aura provides you with a complete online safety toolkit, credit and transaction monitoring, a secure password manager, a privacy-enhancing VPN, and more. Try Aura risk-free with a 14-day trial at Aura.com slash safety. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash safety. Rest easy with Aura. Visit A-U-R-A dot com slash safety today.